Thank you. So uh, I'm Hamid Bakili. I'm a physics PhD student at the University of Virginia. Today I will be talking about uh, this project that we have been working on, uh, which is uh, about using the Hermion ring racetracks for unconventional computing. Now, first, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, do a short review of what's, what are the Eschermions and what's their properties. For example, uh, where can we find them? Uh, what the dynamical behavior? Uh, are they stable enough at room temperature, for example? for the device application and how can we uh, like deterministically at least nucleate and annihilate the Eschermians. So as for uh, the, what are the Eschermians? Uh, so the Eschermians are defined as this uh, topological quasi-particles, uh, which is characterized by their, uh, characterized by their topological integer number, which is also called the winding number. And uh, one of the, pro so the reason that people are interested in the Eschermians is that they can be very small, 10 nanometer, and also very fast, uh, even at a moderate amount of uh, spin current half life. And uh, so, for example, for a very simple device that were suggested uh, initially for the Eschermians or domain walls is that. You can consider the lack of Eschermion to be zero, and uh, when you have Eschermion to be one, and use a read head to get this sequence of zero and one. And since uh, they can be moved around by a spin current, uh, they only need uh, very low energy, like uh, smaller than 100 femtojoule, which we will see later. Then uh, that's uh, oversimplifying the problem, and. As for the small and fast Eschermion, uh, the 10 nanometer Eschermions have been able to be observed in the experiments by a Jeffrey Beach group at MIT. And they have also observed that the Eschermion can be as fast as up to like 500, 600 meter per second for moderate amount of currents. But, uh, the, uh, but this small current and fast Eschermions are not the like same Eschermions. So, uh, we will see that uh, the, uh, the size of the Eschermion matters and it might be very difficult to actually achieve that one kilometer per second for a small Eschermion. Now, as for the type of the Eschermions, Eschermions are first uh, classified by their winding number or topological number. Uh, their uh, winding number is defined as this equation, the, the top equation. And uh, this integer winding number that the Eschermions have will give them topological protection. This topological protection mainly means that the Eschermions can be deformed uh, when, they, uh, like, uh, when they see an obstacle or a defect and or by deformation, they can, for example, overcome that obstacle and then still uh, get, regain their original shape and not be annihilated. And two of the, well, this integer winding number can be any number, but uh, mostly uh, the most popular type of the Eschermians have winding number of one. And um, another property of the Eschermians is their domain wall angle, which this domain wall angle can uh, separate the Eschermians in two types, a nil Eschermian and Bloch Eschermian. And we can see in the bottom figures, the top view and side view of nil and Bloch Eschermian. The difference between these two, although they are topologically equivalent, is that um, for nil Eschermion, their, uh, Eschermion uh, their domain wall angle is zero or 180 degrees, depends on how you define that, uh, compared to the uh, radial direction. But for Bloch Eschermion, it's perpendicular to the radial direction, is 90 degrees, uh, and we'll see later uh, what difference that will make. Uh, so now, uh, why do Eschermions exist in a ferromagnet? Uh, uh, we can write the energy of the as a ferromagnet as a sum of exchange energy, DMI energy, magnetization, uh, demagnetization energy, and anisotropy, and also if there is any external field. Now, uh, in a normal ferromagnet, you won't have DMI necessarily. And, uh, but you cannot uh, still have the Eschermions uh, that would need a very large demagnetization compared to anisotropy. 
but uh, if we add a DMI component to our energy, we can see that uh, we can actually stabilize various uh, uh, small skirmions, uh, at least theoretically. And this DMI energy, the reason that it can then help us create these skirmions is that uh, opposed to the, ex the exchange energy wants the uh, magnetic moments of ferromagnet to be all parallel to each other or anti-parallel to each other, depending on the sign of the exchange energy. But DMI wants them to be perpendicular to each other, which this competition between exchange DMI and the other energy terms uh, will give us then a uh, meta-stable state of the uh, skirmion. These uh, energy terms can also be approximated con uh, by using these continuous appro approximations and then find the radius of the skirmions uh, semi-analytically. Uh, and we can see in the figure that it uh, agrees pretty well uh, uh, with the numerical stimulation. Now, uh, we mentioned that there are two types of the skirmion uh, for the uh, nil skirmion we would need some kind of uh, ferromagnet heavy metal heteroextraja. Uh, this heterostructure will provide this interfacial symmetry breaking, which is needed to have this interfacial DMI. That would give us the nil skirmion. Uh, for block skirmions, we have two options. Uh, one is to have very large demagnetization uh, field compared to the anisotropy, or uh, we can use B20 materials, which they have a bulk emergent symmetry. So for the case of uh, block skirmion, uh, you don't necessarily need heavy metal layers to stabilize it, uh, but uh, so the ferromagnet itself can be enough. So now uh, for a group of materials that we have been studying, uh, they can be uh, suitable candidates for uh, nil skirmions are MN based Inger Soislers. Uh, the reason for uh, this, uh, the reason that these inverse Soislers can be uh, optimal candidates for nil skirmions is that they have very small bulk uh, damping, they have a small, they are ferry magnets, so they have a small uh, saturation magnetization. And also, uh, from DFT calculation, at least, it has been seen that uh, the tetragonal phase can be stable at the room temperature. And this, uh, the reason for a small, the reason that the small damping and a small magnetization is uh, important, as we will see later, is that it will give us the option to have a very fast skirmia. And we have also done the macromagnetic simulations for these materials, and we see that there is a phase a space that we can have uh, a very small skirmions, uh, smaller than 10 nanometer. And uh, they, from the calculations, they can be uh, stable at the room temperature. Now, uh, to understand the dynamics of the skirmions, uh, we have to look at this uh, LLG equation, which describes how the magnetic moments in a ferromagnet uh, evolve. And this, uh, as you can see from this equation, the first two terms are uh, basically internal uh, dynamics of the ferromagnet. And uh, we can also add, for example, a spin orbit torque or a spin transfer torque uh, to basically uh, drive the experiments. For, so for the most energy efficient uh, way to drive the experiments uh, has been the spin orbit torque, which is by applying uh, electric current to the heavy metal layer and due to a spin hall effect, that heavy metal layer will uh, provide us with some uh, spin current. Then that uh, spin current will apply uh, some uh, momentum, uh, uh, angular momentum to the skirmion. That transfer of angular momentum will result in um, uh, external force. Simplifying everything, uh, we can get this TLA equation, which is kind of similar to the uh, Newton's equations for particles. We have some uh, force, external force, which comes from the spin orbit torque. There is dissipation force, which is similar to the friction force. And there is Magnus force, which is similar to, a, for example, a ball moving in a current uh, or in, a, like a, in air or in water. And there, for the, we can also extend it to multiple sublattice ferromagnets, which that can be taken care of by this inter-sublattice force. 
And for the case of uh, Bloch and Neil Eskermian, uh, the force from a spin orbital for Bloch Eskermian will be perpendicular to the spin current, the, uh, the electric current direction. Uh, for Neil Eskermian, it will be parallel. But uh, from the Magnus force, we can see that uh, whatever the direction of uh, uh, speed is, that Magnus force will be perpendicular to that. So the result is that uh, we will have for the Neil and Bloch Eskermian, they will not move parallel to the uh, electric current. They will have some angle with it, which uh, we call it um, spin hall, uh, Eskermian hall angle. Now, uh, one case uh, that can be interesting is that if we use this B20 materials, which have the bulk invariant symmetry with heavy metal layers, which provide us with interfacial uh, breaking, uh, symmetry breaking, this will result in a hybrid Eskermion. And these hybrid Eskermions uh, depend, the domain wall angle of these hybrid Eskermions will depend on the energy ratio of these uh, two types of DMI that come from interfacial symmetry breaking and the bulk invariant symmetry break. And uh, so uh, then okay, we'll see how they can be used. Uh, and so for this case, uh, for the block and Neil Eskermian, for pure uh, block and Neil Eskermians, uh, they move perpendicular to each other. But for a hybrid Eskermian, they will move somewhere in between. Uh, how much in between depends on the uh, domain wall angle of the Eskermian which in turn depend on the ratio of the two types of the DMIs that we described before. Now, one way to use this, um, sorry, this uh, ability, this hybrid is that, uh, sorry, one more time. So one way to use these uh, hybrid Eskermians is to is by using this uh, heavy metal layer with varying composition of heavy metal. For example, if we use a platin pure platinum, uh, we will get uh, interfacial uh, symmetry breaking, which is for the nil Eskermians. And if we add another material, for example, tungsten to it. Uh, it can cancel out some of that. Uh, and so for the composition of some platinum, some uh, tungsten, for example, we will get a smaller interfacial DMI for this. Uh, and for the side of the material that have pure platinum, we will have the largest interfacial DMI. And then if you use a B20, so what happens is that the Eskermian domain wall angle from one end to the other end, from the end that have the pure platinum to the end that have a composition of platinum and some other material, uh, we will see that this uh, Eskermian domain wall angle can change. And uh, in order to see that, we have done the macromagnetic simulations. And we can see that if Eskermian from, uh, starts from a given position, when it's uh, driven, uh, it will do to this Eskermion Hall angle, it will have some uh, movement in the Y direction, but eventu eventually it will reach at some point that uh, this ratio of interfacial DMI and uh, bulk DMI will give us this uh, critical domain wall angle, which results in a movement of Eskermion that is parallel to the electric current. Now, uh, the results, we have also done DFT calculations by uh, Golan Morshed, uh, one of our colleagues. And we see that uh, actually, if we change the composition of platinum, uh, the, DM, DM, the interfacial DMI will change. And this actually uh, captures the same trend than the, as the experimental results. Now, uh, one way to use this, uh, uh, this ability of hybrid Eskermian to self-convert themselves to these lines that uh, uh, move uh, parallel to the electric current is by, for example, uh, as this as shown in this figure, is by using, for example, a VCMA gate. Uh, okay, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, actually, so this Eskermian. Uh, Self-converting lane depends on the size of the Eskermion. The size of Eskermion uh, 
in turn depends on the anisotropy. And now we can change the anisotropy, for example, by using a VCMA gate. And uh, this would relate basically that convergence link uh, to the voltage that the v is applied to the VCMA gate. Now, if we use both of these hybrid ischemia and VCMA gate, we can see that if we use a VCMA gate, um, we can actually uh, control the convergence of the ischemians. And if we provide the ischemians with the defined lanes, we, uh, depending on the voltage that is applied to the VCMA gate, we can choose which lane that ischemian can go into. This would give us a type of uh, a stepping function. Uh, at the zero temperature level, it will be like a sharp stepping function, but at uh, room temperature due to thermal effects, there will be some randomness at some points, but uh, we have seen that it's fairly stable compared to the room temperature. Now we will see later how, then, how this can be used in an actual device. But uh, for now, let's look at the lifetime of the experiments. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, the ischemians, depending on the application, uh, may need to be stable for maybe days or years. So that is important uh, to understand how a stable ischemian can be. To calculate the lifetime of the ischemian by using transition state theory, numerically can uh, the ischemian lifetime can be calculated. And the way that it happens is that uh, you find that well, how much is the energy barrier the energy barrier in the case of ischemians, since ischemians, the isolated ischemians at least are metastable state. So this metastable state has a finite amount of uh, barrier compared to the, uh, for example, ferromagnetic state. And uh, the way that this uh, energy barrier changes is that, for example, generally for larger ischemians, we have larger energy barrier. But the effect of the parameters on this energy barrier of the ischemion is different from each other. So as we can see, uh, if we uh, decrease the anisotropy, it doesn't necessarily change the radius as much as the changing the DMI does. But uh, changing the anisotropy uh, in can increase or decrease the uh, energy barrier more rapidly compared to the DMI. And uh, now uh, let's uh, look at how we can nucleate or annihilate the ischemians as it has been done experimentally. So at room temperature, uh, when people apply the spin current pulses, they have observed that at the places of defects or when the, at the places of the ferromagnetic grains, which the anisotropy changes, some ischemians are nucleated or uh, in the case of the uh, right picture, they have seen that if they use this uh, constricted geometry, uh, ischemian actually nucleates around the edges. And also for annihilation of the ischemian, uh, people have seen that you can use uh, current pulse, but maybe in the di opposite direction to basically uh, hit the ischemian at the, to the edges of the ferromagnet. At the, what happens is that when the ischemian hit the edges, uh, if the spin current is strong enough, it can overcome that topological protection of ischemian and the ischemian will be finally annihilated. As we can see from this experimental result uh, for the nucleation, uh, they have observed that uh, when they apply a current pulse, they can see multiple number of ischemia that for annihilation, they ap apply a current of opposite direction and they see that the ischemia is annihilated and mainly they reach the edges uh, to be annihilated. And, uh, but the problem here is that the nest doesn't necessarily do it deterministically, which we can talk about that later. Now, uh, for the applications, we will look at uh, three type of general applications that have been, has been proposed for the ischemians. First is the conventional memory, which is, we shortly mentioned before. And also there is unconventional memory, which we have been working on. And there is also logic operations that the ischemians can do. For the conventional memory application of the ischemians, 
in this sense, uh, the schemas and domain laws are pretty similar to each other. The way it works is that, again, uh, imagine uh, the lack of Eskamian or a domain wall to be zero and existence of it uh, to be a, a bit one. And then if we apply the spin current and move them around and using a reading head, uh, we can uh, determine what's the sequence of zero and one, which would basically be our stored information. Uh, now, one uh, application that we have proposed is to use the Eskamian uh, wavefront memory. The way uh, wavefront works uh, is that instead of uh, storing the information as zero and one, we use uh, the incoming uh, timing, for example, T1 and T2 as our information. Now, obviously we can always uh, store T1 and T2 in a normal memory, in a Boolean memory, but it would require a transfer of that uh, information, for example, to our processing unit. So this back and forth between this memory and CPU uh, can be very energy and time consuming. So it would be uh, probably beneficial to the applications that you use the wavefront uh, to have this kind of natural memory for them, you can say. Now, uh, this wavefront memory, uh, one of their main applications is for the race logic operations. So one example of this race uh, logic operations is by is to use it to determine if two DNA strands are similar to each other or not. The way it works is that it compares the uh, building blocks of these uh, DNAs, which are proteins, and then compare them, compare them to each other and see whether if uh, they are similar or not. And uh, the, the way the race logic works is that uh, by at each step, it will compare these two and then it goes to the next step. So after, for example, let's say seven or 10 next steps, uh, it will determine uh, if these uh, two DNAs are similar to each other. And this number of steps is uh, analogous to this, uh, timing of the wavefront, which we mentioned in the previous slide. And uh, to do that, uh, uh, we have proposed that we can use domain bar Eskamian racetrack memory. The way it works is that, uh, for example, we, as in this bottom figure, we put this, okay, so bottom figure is for two uh, incoming wavefronts. And uh, we use one uh, read MTJ at the beginning of each of these racetracks. Now, uh, the important thing to point out is that since uh, we are storing the timing of the Iskermians, if we read the Iskermians uh, in main racetrack A and main racetrack B at same position, what happens is that when they reach that position and we have read the timing, now they are at the same position. So we no longer have this related information of this relative position of the Eskermian. So we need a recovery racetrack, which would be a store the uh, timing of, restore the timing of the Eskermian after we have read them. Now, the way it works is that, uh, for example, let's say we have in the main racetrack A, we have moved the Eskermian for a time uh, tau minus T1, tau being the total time that it needs to reach the end of the racetrack. And after the, when we move the Eskermian to read it at the end MTJ, we uh, in parallel move the Eskermian in the recovery racetrack uh, with time T1. T1 is the time that takes the Eskermian to reach the end MTJ after it has been written onto the racetrack. And then we can see that uh, we have actually able to recover the stored relative information of the timing of the experiment. And uh, so this is the uh, circuit design for this uh, proposed device. It's fairly uh, simple. And uh, we use these MTJs to read the experiment. We will later explain how this read MTJ works, but uh, we use these read MTJs to read the Eskermian. And the way it works is that, for example, uh, from a certain point, it will turn on. And 
uh, from for the time that it needs the skirmion to reach the MTJ, it will uh, be, for example, on. So it will give an output of one. So we will we see that here. We actually uh, been able to uh, get this kind of wavefront form of the outputs. And uh, so the benefit of this uh, type of Skermion wavefront over their uh, CMOS counterpart is that uh, they can be uh, more energy efficient and also they are non volatile. So, for the case of CMOS, it's not possible to be uh, to have a non volatile memory for wavefronts and be this energy efficient because uh, for the CMOS it has to be on all uh, it has to be always on to uh, store the memory but for this wave uh, skermion or domain wall uh, wavefront memory uh, we can turn off the device and they will stay at their position now uh, we mentioned that this um, energy consumption that people suggest to be smaller than 100 femtojoule is oversimplifying the matter because as we can see in the breakdown of the energy consumption of this skirmion uh, racetrack uh, we see that it's much smaller uh, than they actually did. it's smaller than 100 femtojoule but uh, the main energy consumption is happening at the transistors as we can see it can be one order of magnitude larger than the energy that is consumed in the racetrack and uh, now, as for the logic operations, so uh, this uh, structure is the same as the this uh, self-converging hybrid discriminant that we talked about. Uh, now, what happens is that, for example, for this case, we have been using uh, uh, each lane as a logic operation. So, a group of operation, for example, and or x or, uh, they can go into uh, lane one, for example, and lane two. So depending on what kind of application we want to use, uh, we put the skirmion in that corresponding lane. And then uh, since we can move the skirmion back and put in another lane, uh, for, so it can be reconfigurable uh, logic operation. Now it will be a slower than a CMOS uh, logic operation, but it can have the area advantage of the, uh, compared to the CMOS operation. Now, uh, another uh, advantage is that we have only one nucleation site, since we only uh, <clears throat> nucleate the skirmion once. If we can uh, be sure that it's not annihilated, uh, we don't ne really need uh, uh, multiple skirmion nucleations. Uh, now, uh, another uh, the applications that are proposed for the skirmions by other groups is that uh, is to use these skirmions for probabilistic uh, computing. Okay, sh uh, short description of how it works uh, is that by, for example, using two uh, regions that have uh, uh, multiple number of skirmions in them, and due to the thermal effect, uh, this uh, skirmion. Uh, as they go in, they can be reshuffled in there basically, and their sequence of coming out will be different. So, if uh, in one region we are uh, saying that the each skirmion coming out would correspond to one, then each skirmion coming uh, out from this other region will be zero. So, now that we have reshuffled the sequence of skirmions going in and out, um, yeah, our output uh, and input will have a different sequence, uh, which can be uh, used for probabilistic computations. And uh, they have also showed that uh, how the correlation function changes with uh, current. And they saw that for a small current, actually the correlation is uh, very small, but as they increase the current, uh, well, since the force from the current overcomes the thermal effects, uh, they see that the correlation actually increases so that the reshuffling uh, will happen less for larger current. Uh, now, another application that people actually been able to do it in experimentally is to use a skirmion for neuromorphic computing, uh, similar to the way that they 
we mentioned the creation of the skirmians they apply spin current pulses and they uh, create a certain amount of these skirmians and they depending on the number of times that they are applying this pulse current and the direction of this pulse current they can actually achieve these different states of the neuron so when we have a multiple number of skirmians uh, it's like when the neuron is working and then when it, we have uh, a smaller number of these cameras, they have fewer, they, like they, is turned off. And uh, they have actually seen, seen and uh, see that uh, this accuracy of this device were 89% compared to this software-based training, uh, which they saw a 94% accuracy. Uh, so it's comparable to existing uh, ways of doing the neuromorphic computing. And uh, now, as for the challenges for the Scarimian devices, uh, we mentioned before that uh, the Scarimian needs to be a small and fast to have to be competitive compared to uh, existing existing technology. But there are also other uh, other challenges other than, for example, lifetime size and the speed, which uh, come out in a, to have a reliable device. The first one is the re readability, which we will talk about. And then uh, another, the next would be the deterministic nucleation annihilation. And last, we will talk about this positional stability and how to uh, control it. So now for the readability, uh, we have mentioned multiple times that we use MTJs to read the Ascarmians. The way these MTJs work is by uh, using this TMR effect. Uh, we will see that, for example, the resistance of the MTJ changes as the scheming is there or is not there. So, uh, so uh, what happens is that uh, when the scheming reaches there, uh, the uh, resistance, for example, can be much higher. And when there is no scheming there, the uh, resistance will be smaller. So then we can use that uh, to have a swing in our uh, voltage. This output from the voltage then can be used to uh, determine uh, whether we have a skirmion or we don't have a skirmion, which would give us the reading of the skirmion. Now, what happens is that since skirmions are not, uh, are not uh, like flipping this uh, layer completely, um, they have some effective TMR, which depends on the size of the Ascarmion compared to the size of the fixed layer of the MTJ. And also uh, the Ascarmions are not all of the magnetic moments of the Ascarmions in the Z or minus Z direction. So the effective TMR, depending on the size of the Ascarmion can be even like one third of the absolute TMR effect. And from our SPICE simulations, which uh, were done by uh, Samir Anganguly and uh, uh, Nasmus from our uh, other groups, that, uh, from Mircea Stans group that we work with, uh, we have seen that the TMR effect of a smaller than 50, t sorry, uh, the absolute TMR of 50% and uh, with gate voltage of one, we were able to see that uh, it's, it's still possible to, uh, to have the escamians in a circuit, but smaller than that, um, we have to use larger uh, applied voltages, which would increase the energy consumption. And, uh, well, I mean, depend on the application, that might not be still a problem, but that's 50% uh, is probably a lower limit. And uh, now for, on desired nucleation and annihilation of the ascarmians. Um, so uh, in a normal ferromagnet, we have many natural defects and regions of lower or higher anisotropy, which they, people cannot really completely uh, remove them in the fabrication process. What happens is that then when you are moving the ascarmion, if your uh, spin current is too high, uh, unwanted skirmions can be nucleated at this uh, natural defects position. What can also happen is that at this, again, these defects or edges of the ferromagnet or racerach 
when we apply the spin current of, that is too large, they can hit them and uh, be annihilated, which can be helpful, but if we, we have to find out a way to make sure that it's not happening without our knowledge or uh, it's not happening by itself. And uh, uh, there is also this uh, positional stability of ischemians that is very important for device applications. Since again, uh, if we don't have any defect, if the mat heavy metal, sorry, if the ferromagnet is very clean, this uh, Brownian motion of the ischemians will be very large. And so they can be displaced completely so that when you have this zero and ones, uh, the sequence of zero and ones can be completely destroyed. Uh, since if the experiments are randomly moving around uh, and we see that even after like one second, the uh, experiment can cover a few hundred nanometers, which can completely ruin the device. Uh, and on the other side, if we have uh, material that has too much defects, it might be very difficult to move the ischemian or uh, ischemian might get annihilated all the time or uh, nucleated, like this unwanted nucleation and allyl annihilations due to, and also when we have too much defects, uh, the spinning, unpinning, the critical unpinning current can be too large to be uh, reliable in a device. Now, one way to overcome that, uh, is by using the by using the by engineering defects at the racetrack. So by engineering defects, I mean, for example, uh, if we put a notch, which is just a um, part of the material to be removed, or for example, using the higher anisotropy at this part of the racetrack, or even changing like other parameters like BMI. Uh, what happens is that the if we use a current uh, correct uh, um, uh, properties that those defects, we can see that actually it will provide us with this energy barrier from one side of the uh, defect to the other side. Now, the idea here would be to use multiple number of these defects and these eschermions between these defects, they can diffuse around uh, between these defects, but that doesn't matter that much because that region is uh, small. Uh, but we are limiting the ischemian movement only to that region between the these engineered defects. Now, uh, it's this energy barrier from defects can be even as high as uh, 40 kT, which uh, is enough for long-term memory applications. And uh, also, um, yeah, so this uh, energy barrier will depend also on the uh, size of the experiment compared to the size that it can go through. As you can see in the middle figure, the experiment shrinks a little bit, uh, but this shrinking ability has some uh, limit to it. And uh, so in conclusion, for the uh, Escamion or domain wall application, uh, they might be better suited for unconventional applications or even uh, probabilistic applications uh, rather than this Boolean memories, uh, because these uh, small eschermions are not fast, and fast eschermions are too large, and they can also diffuse very easily. Uh, so it's also important, uh, for example, if we are using this engineering, we are engineering defects, or uh, if we are using the, for example, for if, if we are using the device for long terms, we have to understand what's the limits for current that do not accidentally nucleate or annihilate the skermion. And also, uh, we, it's important to understand that uh, these transistors that turn or turn off the currents in the racetrack are actually uh, more energy consumption, actually take more energy compared to the actual magnetic racetrack, which uh, has to be taken into account when uh, people are designing the devices for ischemians. And also, uh, and lastly, we have to, it might be important to use this uh, defect engineering, either defect engineering or just uh, uh, being able to uh, fabricate fer uh, ferromagnetic materials with certain amount of defects. 
so that uh, they are not pinned, the scammers uh, are not pinned that much, uh, but on the other hand also, uh, they can be stabilized, their position can be stable. So uh, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Uh, I actually have, so, so I have, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on skirmions, but I have quite a, and, and so I have quite a few questions. Yep. So uh, first of all, when thinking about a memory, I imagine there needs to be some initialization. So is there a way to controllably create uh, skirmions at given positions? or anything that seems to be like a the first step uh, yeah so people have suggested that there are some like deterministic methods to nucleate these schemas for example in this right figure uh, they did quite almost deterministically do it so uh, but the number of schemas were not that deterministic like they sometimes nucleated two schemas and sometimes one schema uh, there is also another way which I didn't actually mention is to, by using actually this MTJs to nucleate the Ascamian. At each position of the MTJ, you can nucleate one Ascamian, but that's uh, that needs a, a very large current compared to this heavy metal. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, in short, I mean, it, it should, <laughs> theoretically it's possible, uh, but in the device, people have not shown yet that. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. And uh, so also how to, um, so, so, yeah, so I'd like to understand better your statement about uh, uh, the relation between the size and the usability of the skirmins. So, uh, so if I understand correct, the small skirmins, they're, they're, uh, they, they respond, uh, they do not respond to current well because yeah. uh, the Magnus force is small. Uh, so the uh, smaller skirmions move uh, slower. Uh, see, uh, like, uh, let me see. Uh, so the uh, Magnus force, so Magnus force will be uh, smaller, uh, but a spin orbit torque on the, uh, on the smaller skirmions will also be uh, smaller. So that will result in a slower skirmion and also a smaller skirmion, since they are just a smaller, they feel a, less, a smaller percentage of the uh, MTJ. So the readability will be also lower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's clear. And uh, oh, another thing about the racetrack memory isn't that one actually more vulnerable to uh, to diffusion and the randomness in the skirmian uh, movement yeah that's yeah that's correct uh, so for this one yeah uh, we um, suggested that this in defect engineering um, so if for example you put multiple defects these notches at the racetrack you can uh, basically quantize the position of the ischemian. Uh, so that's the work that's been going on actually. Yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's a problem. I see. All right, thanks. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I have a question also. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so first of all, I want to thank you for the nice talk. It's a very uh, like, uh, to say sorry i'm just after work i'm <laughs> um, so uh, i i it, it it is a talk for a large audience like not for this small group of people uh, so i hope uh, more people will see it at some other point uh, yeah so uh, i had a question about your slide 13. slide 13. 13 yeah uh, there was this experimental things. Yeah, so could you please explain to me as a non-specialist uh, how this experiment, uh, you are not experimentalist, I understand, yeah. but uh, how was it done? So you are saying uh, there are uh, spin waves uh, that affect skirmion, which is 
placed in the middle of this kind of wire, right? Well, how, how was it? So there is a mm. scheme on the right hand side. Could you please tell how was it going? So in the right hand side, uh, this is it, like the top view, uh, top view of the ferromagnet. So it's a ferromagnet on top of a heavy metal. And this, uh, they have cut basically parts of this uh, ferromagnet. So mm. the ferromagnet is not just a, a straight rectangular. Mm -hmm. uh, what they saw that when they apply a current to the heavy metal, uh, so this current is uniform. Okay. Uh, but since the, there is this edge effects, which they have cut uh, at the, around these edges, uh, they saw that they can uh, nucleate the experiment. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because at the edges, these magnetic moments are tilted, so they are not exactly straight up. Ah, okay, but uh, but the current, when you say the current, this is like real current or spin current? I so, mean, the charge yeah. current or spin current, sorry. Yeah, uh, so let me show this figure. Okay. Uh, so imagine, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so this uh, light blue color is the heavy metal layer. Mm -hmm. You apply the electric current to that, uh, then charge, it, charge current, right? Yes, charge current. Uh -huh. uh, in the heavy metal, then due to this uh, spin hall effect, uh, electrons with spin up and down will separate. So for example, okay. spin up, let's say goes to the top surface, spin down goes to the bottom surface. The spin top at the top surface will apply some spin basic, they transfer their spins to the ferromagnet. And then uh, this will effectively be like a, a spin current. Uh, 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 okay, so you kind of pump the spins there. Yes. So it is a spin current. So you affect skirmions with a spin current in the end, right? Yeah. Or yeah. the effect. Aha, uh -huh. okay, okay, good. And why do you call nanowire that 90 nanometers thin? Is it really like acts as a 1D, 1D conductor? 900 nanometers question. is pretty much. I don't oh, know. 900 nanometers. Uh, can you repeat your question? So this is, uh, I just wonder why is it called the wire? Because uh, it is 900 nanometers, which is pretty much uh, like the width. Is it really acting as a 1D system? Uh, so what? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know why they call it wire. <laughs> no, maybe it is. I don't know. No, so uh, the wire is nine hundred nanometer. The the width of the width of it is nine hundred. So there is a like wire beneath it. That's the heavy metal. Ah, uh, okay. No, maybe maybe for this material, I don't know. Or maybe they don't really need it. Uh, one D. I mean. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it's your turn <laughs> to ask something. <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, that's it. So, I'll, okay. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 So, okay.